Welcome back, everybody, to the Too Easy Project. I am your host, Bill Berg. We are back with episode eight of the podcast. I am joined today by Coach Gish. Now, Coach Gish is the strength and conditioning coach for the University of Northwestern in St. Paul. Uh, coach Gish, thanks for having, uh, coming on the show today. Oh, thanks. Absolutely, man. I'm, uh, I'm excited. Um, I've listened to several episodes. I think you've got a great project going here, and I love the, uh, I love the concept of Too Easy and the mentality behind it. It's great. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming on. So uh, I was walking in the fitness center one of those days, uh, the Erickson, and I saw that your picture was up in the wall. Uh, do you know which one I'm talking about? Are you talking about upstairs? Yeah. Yes. Super, the long haired, uh, goofy kid, college track and field picture. Yes, that was uh, many moons ago. But uh, yeah, my, my senior year of track, um, I grew my hair out for about seven or eight months. Um, <laughs> normally, and for most of my life, I've kept it really tight. And, uh, and I let it go, me and a couple of the guys I was living with. And uh, yeah, it, it, never again. We'll just say that much. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask what, uh, you know, what were you up there for? What do you, what do you have the plaque up there for? Uh, yeah. So, um, my, my sporting background is, is track and field. I, uh, I was one of the oddballs. A lot of people track is kind of their second sport. Um, for me, probably ever since middle school track quickly became my number one. Um, I'm a bit type a, um, uh, and I liked the, uh, the really measurable nature of track and field, uh, I liked, and I mean, we can talk about it too, but it also kind of fits into what I do for a living. I, I, I liked having um, something where uh, success and failure was 100% on you. And that, um, that excited me um, that, uh, that, that when you compete, um, when you see the improvements in the results of your competition, um, you could directly tie that to the training process. Not a lot of sports like that um, exist. You know, I, I also played football throughout high school, but that was one of my least favorite things about team sports was um, how you win and how you um, improve a team's record is very complicated. Um, and it's a fun problem to solve, but it's a very complicated problem to solve. It's not too hard in a sport like track and field just because there are, and other sports too, things like uh, weightlifting, things like swimming. Um, there are a lot less variables. And so when it comes to um, increasing performance, you can get uh, pretty detailed with the training process. Um, and the more meticulous you are, usually the results will go up. Um, and, uh, and it's a lot more linear in nature. And the way my mind work just clicked with that. And so, uh, yeah, I did, I did track um, um, pretty much for uh, the better part of a decade of my life, all the way from middle school through college. Uh, my events were uh, the throws, um, so shot put and discus in high school. And then in college, they include um, the hammer, the weight throw, and the javelin. I would say my specialty was probably the weight throw or the hammer. Um, with the second specialty being discus. I also threw shot too, but, but those uh, weight throw, hammer throw, and discus were probably my, um, my top three. So yeah, it was, it was a super fun experience to be able to do it at Northwestern. Um, as an alum, it's, it's fun to also be back now working there. Um, but yeah, track and field was, was kind of my sporting background. And then I like how you mentioned that, that uh, personal you know, achievement, it's very easy to track your progress and to make, uh, mm -hmm. you know, progress in, a, in, in, uh, and it's very, it's very easy to tailor your training according to the progress that you see. And that's something I 100%. like, with the, you know, and, and that leads me to your power lifting. I don't know. I don't know all that you've, uh, accomplished within this. Someone was telling me about it. Um, yeah. what have you done in, in that realm? Well, it was, uh, it was kind of a natural segue. I mean, I'm a competitive person. I like competing. Um, uh, it's exciting. It, it's kind of funny as, as someone who, uh, coaches other people in the weight room, it's, it's easy to make the assumption that he must love lifting weights. And I do, um, but having something to compete for, uh, makes it a lot easier to go train every day. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so I continued on competing after college in a sport called weightlifting. Um, so we always joke, um, in weightlifting that, that it's a lot it's funny how there's kind of two sports out there, uh, Bill. So you have weightlifting and you have powerlifting. Powerlifting okay. is uh, squat, bench, and deadlift. Okay. Um, and you get three attempts uh, at each of those, and your combined uh, total is what you're scored on. 
Weightlifting is uh, the movements snatch and clean and jerk. And again, you get three attempts at each of those and your combined total is what hmm. you're, uh, you're competed on. And both of those, like wrestling, have weight classes. So you compete against athletes of a similar mass. And uh, I competed in weightlifting. Um, so the snatch and the clean and jerk. Uh, right out of college, I, I had a job at a fitness center where my boss there was a, was a pretty masterful coach in weightlifting, really well known in the local Minnesota weightlifting community. Um, and so I got into that and, uh, having been a track athlete, we always trained power cleans, we trained some power snatches, but to do full snatches and full cleans with the jerk was a little bit new for me. Um, but I really enjoyed transitioning into that. It was a nice fit for, for my athletic, um, abilities. I'm not really a, uh, uh I, I'm, I'm more likely to give you 120% effort in less than 10 seconds than I am to give you any effort longer than a minute. And so I, I'm a bit, I'm a bit more of a, uh, of, of a sprinter than I am, uh, someone who can endure. So sure. the, uh, so weightlifting was a nice fit, um, with the explosive nature of it, but uh, yeah, I had some success here locally. Um, uh, competing uh, for four or five years, um, made it to nationals four times. Um, it's, 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 it's a fun sport with an awesome community of people that, that do it because they love to do it. Um, and then, uh, and then of course, you know, people always ask like, well, it's an Olympic sport, you know, were you training for the Olympics? And I, it's as much success as I did have and as much fun as I had, I, it's as most people who get into sports know, there's a big difference between kind of amateur, even veteran level success, and then elite level athleticism. Oh, sure. So um, those people who go and compete at the Olympics are, are absolute freaks in their own right. So, but I, I, yeah, I had some success and I, and I liked doing it. And I still, I still try and make it to a competition once a year just to, to stay active and, um, and to have some fun with that community. Uh, you, you had mentioned that uh, it's hard to, to kind of keep up the intensity in those weightlifting practices now that there's not like a competition or or something like that um so i guess my next question is you had this very specific training program for whatever sport you were in at the time or your your goals mm -hmm. back in college or high school uh so now that you don't have anything like that and you know obviously as you grow up there's probably a lot more responsibility and time uh, you know yeah. or time somewhere else so what are your goals like now and, and how has it changed and how are you still involved uh, yourself in the weight room or, in, you know, in the gym? That's a great question. Um, yeah, man, I was, I, I've kind of, I, when I work with athletes and I work with, um, college age students who you can see the zeal and the, the excitement that they get from being in the weight room. And I too felt that it's, a uh, um, it's awesome. The training environment, getting together with your friends and lifting, it's, it's beautiful. Um, but I'd, I'd be lying to you if I didn't say there'll be a day, um, when like, you don't want to touch a weight and, and everyone, everyone thinks you're nuts. Oh man, I'm always going to lift. I'm always, I'm always going to hit my three or my four or my five workouts a week. I, I got to say there was over the last couple of years, there's been like a month where I just don't feel like lifting at all. Um, because I live and breathe it every day. I, yeah. um, you know, when you teach others and you spend five hours on your feet in the weight room five or six days a week, there kind of comes a point where you, you don't want to do your own training. Well, um, do you think it has anything to do with the fact that it's kind of your job now? Cause I oh, know. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That is, that is a hundred percent part of it too. Um, but even then, you know, you mentioned outside responsibilities that, you know, there'll come a time where you sit there and you think, oh, man, like I, I could be working right now instead of training, or I could be spending time with my wife and kids or, mm -hmm. Oh shoot, that, that faucet's leaking. I want to go lift, but I also got to fix that one thing on my house. So it, it, there's always going to, be, and some people I think could call those things excuses, but you and I are both wise enough to know that spending time with, you know, loved ones and, um, and working on a job, uh, there are sometimes that those things can't be excused when training presents itself. Mm -hmm. Um, but that said, I do try and drop everything and still do something physical every single day. Um, what that looks like has changed substantially over the years. Um, right now, um, I'm probably quote unquote lifting. We're trying to do something with load two to three times a week. Um, and then my other days are filled with, you know, it might just be like 
getting around and moving with my kids. We got like a mini climbing wall and gymnastics set up in the basement. So I'll go down there and monkey around with them. Um, we'll go on hikes or walks or bike rides. Uh, when school was in session, um, uh, a couple times a week, some of us staff members would try and shoot hoops or play basketball together. So I, I've, I've transitioned um, away from here's my notebook with my super meticulous written out workout plan for four or five days a week to a little bit more. I train in response to how I'm feeling and what I feel like doing that day um, versus a written out plan per se. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and I, but, and I, and I've seen on uh, the occasions, you know, that you've been in the, the weight room, maybe training some football players or whoever, that it does, you know, you might be getting burnt out mentally from being in the weight room all the time. But, I mean, it's got to be a little taxing, too, because you are staying pretty active while you're in there helping the students, too. And, I mean, it's not like that's not a workout in itself. You know. Yeah, no. No, yeah. I They, they always laugh at me because uh, I'm really good at demonstrating one or two reps of just about everything. Mm -hmm. um, so... Uh, but so yeah, no, there is certainly a physical component to to being a strength conditioning coach or a physical prep coach. Uh, that that part has definitely not burned me out. It's probably more of the uh, if I'm in the northwestern weight room, I'll see something. You know, I'll be in the middle of my lift and I'll see like uh, a bit of chalk on the floor, and I'm like, oh, someone should clean that up. That someone's me. I'm in the middle of the set <laughs> yeah. right now. So that's uh, so that th those are sometimes the distractions um, that that present themselves. And, uh, and turning those off uh, is definitely a mindset that you have to get into as, as life continues. So, so I guess what what's some advice that you have uh, for someone who's maybe uh, forced into giving up their meticulous structured lifting mm. or gym lifestyle? Because it sounds like you kind of were able to to uh, transition pretty smoothly yeah. into that that lifestyle. So, what's your advice then to someone who kind of has no control over it? And who yeah. lives and breathes, you know? Yeah, no, that's that's good, man. I think, uh, you know, wise people have said, you know, that there's a little axiom out there that's, you know, uh, life and, and, and progress in life is, is about slow cooking or smoking something, not pressure cooking it hmm. or, or trying to fry it. And I'm, I'm a bit of a food nut, so that analogy makes sense to me. But, sure, sure. You know, it's when you look at your physical um, culture, and how you want to interact with, with fitness. Um, I've always been of the mindset that I want to be as physically active as I can be for as long as I can be. And that long perspective has helped me um, not just sit there and go, oh my gosh, if I miss a day, I'm going to mess up this whole six week training block. Um, or if I have to cut a week because things just, you know, hit the fan at work or at home um, or this other thing came up. Uh, having the long-term perspective to say that over the course of, instead of a week, I'm a terrible person because I didn't get that lift in or I had to cut one workout short to say over the course of a year, you know, or over the course of a month or several years, this longer perspective, am I still maintaining an active physical culture? Am I still um, sharpening the sword where I can? Um, and then not not beating myself up, right? We have to constantly remind ourselves that, uh, that as much as we like measuring stuff, we are so much more than our max on a lift or our, um, you know, completion of a certain number of workouts or our capabilities, um, in the weight room. Uh, that is, uh, that, that is such a superficial way and I would say probably a way that's going to burn you out because eventually <laughs> as you get older, those numbers will go down, you know, if yeah. you're a, Sure. If you're a four or 500 pound squatter at some point you will cease to, to, you know, hopefully it's not till later, later, later in your life. But, uh, but at some point that will, you won't be able to walk into the, the boardroom and shake everyone's hand and be like, you know, hi, I'm Taylor Gish. I'm a 500 pound squatter. Well, yeah. one, no one will care. Right. And two, um, at some point that won't be what society recognizes you for. Sure. Right. So um, as much as my wife loves me, like she didn't marry me for my, my squat maxes. She didn't marry me for, um, you know, how long I could hold a plank. Right. That's, uh, you know, my, my kids don't, uh, my kids don't want to spend time with me because like, I'm the strong dad. They don't even know, like, they don't know. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they have no concept of that. So remind yourself and your listeners that, that life has such a long, 
Uh, and prayerfully, it has such a long existence that we have to too take that perspective and not be so um, so hard on ourselves sometimes when we maybe skip a workout or I shouldn't say skip because skip is a negative, but like we have to miss something because something bigger came up. Yeah. Um, have that slow cooker perspective of like, I'm really trying to cook this thing over a long period of time and be that, um, be that grandpa or grandma hmm. who's like still in the fight. Um, yeah. yeah. Versus and, that shooting star that burns out quickly. And that's what I've noticed in, in at least what my perspective of your training style now, or what you portray to the students is, is longevity within athletics, you know, and, and, and the, and the word athletic instead of maybe strong or, mm -hmm. or, you know, specialized, but kind of a broad athleticism that's going to carry through and movements that you'll be able to do as an adult too. You know? 100%. And, yeah, especially, I mean, especially Northwestern at the D3 level, um, you know, I would be, I would be very happy and I haven't been at Northwestern long enough for this to be, a, be the case, but you know, a lot of our coaches, uh, our head coaches will say things like, oh, it's such an honor to have our athletes come back, you know, after five or 10 years and introduce us to their spouse and introduce us to their kids or talk about this great job that they have. Um, I think I'm going to get a lot of satisfaction out of people coming back and being like, oh man, I work out on my own up at the Shoreview Y and I do like all of the stuff that you taught me how to do. That, that would be like the most rewarding um, interaction for me. There, there, there's no, do we want to win games and do we want to compete to the glory of God? Absolutely. Here in the here and now, we're going to make decisions in the performance space that allow our athletes to do that. But if we don't have that long-term perspective, I, I don't know if I'd get a lot of satisfaction out of it. Sure. doing what I do. And, and I want to get into the meat and potatoes of it now that we've kind of yeah, talked let's about do it. the longevity and stuff. Um, so I think a, an aspect of exercising or, or specifically lifting, that's kind of everybody is aware of it, but no one really uh, pays attention to it or at least cares about it. Uh, like stretching and warming up. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know how many guys go into the weight room and then kind of just put on 225 on bench without – <laughs> doing proper warm-up i don't you know that Too might many. be a stretch but yeah yeah Too many. Uh, but you know like i said from what you've you've you portray to your students it's, it's safety you know form warming up and stretching and 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 like i said people hear it constantly everybody knows you're supposed to stretch you're supposed to warm up but what does that really mean and uh you know let's talk about stretching first let's let's do warm up warming up next but like as far as stretching goes when do you stretch for what mm. kind of movements should you stretch for? Uh, and, and what's the science behind it? Why does it work? Yeah. So I, uh, I think one of the mis most misleading things, and it's partly it's the English language, but um, it's like, we, I think before we say when and how it's helpful to define what stretching is yep. and kind of the two buckets that, that um, is pretty much recognized by the, the literature is there's dynamic stretching and then there's static stretching. Um, and the two biggest things with there that, that, that differentiate is the uh, dynamic stretching is going to take a muscle through a range of motion while you're in control of it um, and promote the flow of blood and lymph and other fluids. Um, okay. So the difference there would be like I could hold a calf stretch. That would be a static stretch. I could do like ankle circles and just make some angle. Or, you know, we've warmed up and we've had the athletes like, you know, cursive your name with your ankle, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the circle or the, the writing of the name of the ankle is a dynamic um, stretch, quote unquote, right. or a dynamic uh, movement for the ankle and that kind of lower foot. Um, whereas the, the calf stretch, just kind of static hold, um, it, it does not as much as the dynamic work promote the flow of blood. And because of that difference between them, I'm not going to spend my time static stretching before training or before lifting or before practice. And that's purely because of that blood flow piece. Now, does that make like sitting and holding a stretch negative? Absolutely not. But because it doesn't promote um, uh, the principle of thermodynamics, like literally warming up, uh, I can't spend my time doing that. Um, if I'm, if I'm thinking about safety and preparing for, um, preparing for the lift ahead. So what's going on during a stretch or a warm up, though? I mean, like, like everyone knows you, you, 
promote the, like you get the muscle ready, at least, you know, like I said, people will go onto the bench and they do 225, but maybe right. they'll go and do the bar first and then they go and put a 45 on or something like yep. that. But, but what is happening within the muscle and, and the tendons and things that that's, that's promoting safety? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the unfortunate thing is, is again, it's part of that English language. Like people, people use the word stretch because, you know, if I, if I kind of reach my elbow back, um, at the end, you know, I, I, I can feel a stretch across my pec, or if I straighten my arm out, I can kind of feel a stretch across my shoulder. Well, that doesn't mean you're stretching if you can feel something, uh, ex- you know, kind of extending. So, sure. um, at a musculoskeletal level, uh, we actually, and thank goodness we can't literally stretch, right? Because if we literally stretched, um, you know, we'd see things tear because that's mm. our, our bodies are, uh, are very durable, but you know, tendons, ligaments, and the muscle body itself, um, if held in a static position for a while, um, can increase ranges of motion, right? So like, let's use, um, let's maybe use one that, one that, um, a very popular, uh, static stretch is like touching your toes. Right. So I'm going to sit on the ground and I'm going to reach my arms forward towards my shins. And then, you know, maybe over time I can grab onto a toe, sit and reach, uh, is the example. Mm-hmm. I think the question we have to ask ourselves, Bill, is are we increasing ranges of motion at the hip or are we just promoting some joint laxity at the low back? And that to me is sometimes, if, if I don't know the answer to that question, which is somewhat individualized and depending on the position you're in during that stretch, I, I don't know if I can be a big fan of, of, of stretching if, if that's what it looks like. Mm-hmm. Um, and, 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 that, and that being the hardest part of, of being like a fan of static stretching for me is are we actually changing things on a muscle, uh, on, on like muscles, tendons, and ligaments, soft tissue? Um, or are we like forcing joint laxity and joint laxity can be dangerous, um, from an injury standpoint. So, um, that to me is where I kind of sit and go, geez, are we, are we, you know, how are we spending our time on this? And, and is, is that kind of two minute hold while touching my toes actually doing me anything for performance? Yeah. And, and that seems to be like the common, uh, fitness, uh, scientific knowledge these days sure, is that yeah. static stretching is is probably not the best thing to do even though other people's initial reaction to hearing that word is just to go and do like you said a, a, right. a hamstring stretch right before they go for a, a run you know which might not be that beneficial um, correct but i wanted to say when i went to basic training for the air force we had uh differentiating days uh we did running one day and then maybe push-ups and like we called it a strength day the next day and then running and strength but no matter what we were working on we did static stretching for like 20 seconds at a time for each body part like the whole like we did that we did like a hamstring stretch tricep stretch and i found that really weird because we might not even be using this this muscle or you know and then we go and we static stretch it for like 30 seconds at a time and it didn't, to me, I didn't understand the science of it at the time and, or I didn't understand if I was right, but to me, it sounds like you're saying maybe static stretching is not the best thing to do. Yeah. I, th- I really think it's how it's utilized. I don't, you know, it's one of those things where, um, you look at communities like yoga or Pilates, um, and, and, or just someone who's got maybe like a daily habit. you know, the, um, my wife works in senior fitness and there are so many uh, older men and women who have like this morning stretch routine, you know, they get out of bed and they kind of do a couple, like you mentioned this very um, kind of marshaled, you know, arm across the body, elbow behind the ear, bend down and touch the toes. Um, I don't think any of that's negative though. Um, I, I don't want to okay. be screwed there. Um, I, I think, I think all movement is healthy. Um, mm-hmm. But we have to ask if the way that we're moving is is functional, and I mean functional in a sense of does it fit the task that I that I'm expecting or that I am about to do. So when you mention the runner, does a quick it's so funny they call it the runner stretch, but where I pull my heel <laughs> towards my uh, glute and do like a, a quad stretch or a runner stretch, is that the best thing for me to do pre-run? Probably not. Um, but but does that mean that? 
pulling my body into those positions is negative. I, I, I don't believe so. Okay. I, one, one thing I wanted to circle back to is, was I, I don't want to sit here and leave your listeners without helpful ways to increase their mobility um, yep. and improve their flexibility. I, I just don't feel that that is fast tracked by static stretching. Okay. So, um, so when we look at mobility or your ability to control, um, control a muscle or control a limb, um, through like a full and complete range of motion, a lot of people will say like, Oh, you know, well, I have limited ankle mobility or limited hip mobility and it keeps me from getting deeper in a squat. I mean, that, that's a common one that we will hear. Mm-hmm. You know, I, my hips are tight, um, and my ankles and my hamstrings are tight and, and that's why I can't squat deep. And, while there are some gender and training history and even genetic differences amongst people that make them prone towards stiffness and some people prone towards laxity um, or being more mobile or even hypermobile. Um, that said, the, the, a lot of the research, and some of it is kind of within the last decade, but a lot of the literature is now starting to point towards in order to increase those um, specific ranges of motion, we have to spend more time in those positions. So um, if we look at the squat, for instance, um, if your ankles are limited or you've identified that your ankles are limited in range of motion and and the knees can't track over the toes um, as much as you'd like to go deeper in a squat, um, then you have to spend some more time squatting and biomechanically alter the squat so that you can improve your ankle coordination and control. Um, All the calf stretching in the world is not going to free up um, some of those soft tissue limitations um, in the foot and in the ankle. So like an example would be for biomechanical perspective, could I hold the weight like a plate away from me in my warmups to help my body appreciate a deeper and fuller position? All I've done is just sit, give myself a counter that might give me some more ankle dorsiflexion. Could I elevate the heels a little bit on a plate? Um, could I change the, uh, besides holding the plate away, could I change um, my stance position, right? Could I try a little narrower, try a little wider um, and continue to rep those things? It, and again, it comes back, Bill, to like that use of time, right? I could do this kind of big, fancy ankle warm up to make my ankles more mobile, or I could just spend five to 10 minutes playing around with squats in that specific position and I will see mobility improvements there. Same thing for pressing, right? So like, you know, a lot of problem is, you know, people like, well, I can't military press because I really can't get that bar directly over my head. Well, okay, get, get a very high incline and start, you know, kind of with lighter weight warming up and putting yourself into positions where you're reaching up into that full shoulder flexion and, and, and encouraging and facilitating the, the shoulder girdle to do so. Um, versus just like you mentioned, going to the empty bar or even loaded bar and being like, well, I'm just going to do my work sets now. Well, is it any wonder that you aren't improving your stiffness? But what about the people? So, you know, I think the, the time, uh, aspect that you mentioned, a lot of people just don't think that it's worth their time to spend those 10, 15 minutes mm-hmm. or even five minutes before their working sets to <sighs> stretch because they haven't gotten injured yet or they are seeing progress. Yeah. Um, so I guess, I guess what, what, why should somebody who doesn't see the, you know, that reasoning yet, why should somebody take that 10 minutes? Yeah, that's, that's awesome, man. I mean, we, one of our, our softball coach, coach Dumont. So here at Northwestern, I shares the quote. She's like, well, you don't know, but you don't know until you know it. Right. So the hardest part about convincing people is that, uh, you know, everyone's convinced by different things, but the fact of the matter is if they haven't experienced it themselves, it's going to be very hard for them to wrap their heads around it. Yeah. Um, maybe what I can provide here is just like a couple of too emotional or too, you know, maybe, maybe some of your listeners are more like uh, research based or they need the information. Here's how I think about it though, is that if you spend, let's say it's a, you know, 15 minutes um, or even 10, let's just say you say you spend 10 minutes doing some basic warming up uh, or you kind of like you've mentioned on previous podcasts, when you talked about your current workout plan, that's probably time you were spending like on your phone between sets, right? Like, yeah. but if you spent 10 minutes, uh, three times a week, that's 30 minutes a week, right? You get through like a 12 week training block. That's, that's six hours of training 
that you that you could have spent getting better at specific positions. Mm -hmm. um, so in the course of a year, I mean, we're talking about like 20 to 30 hours of, of, of training over the course of, of, of a year of workouts. So that alone, I think merits um, some attention to warming up. The second thing I kind of break it into four things is like, you need to prepare mentally, you need to prepare physically, warming up prevents injuries. Um, we could cite a whole bunch of research papers on that. Um, I think when it does come to injury prevention, we have to look at how we're warming up. So again, doing the empty bar for one set, then putting 225 on, is it categorically a warm up? Yes. Is there room for improvement? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And then the last thing would be performance enhancement. So those four things, um, if I go to the first one, mental, mental readiness, uh, for, for fitness enthusiasts, uh, a lot of times you're training kind of after work or after class, or like, it's just nice to have the warm up be like this break between what was going on in your day and bringing your attention to what's going on in the here and now. When you ask me questions about my own fitness journey, I think if, if I don't warm up, I'll continue to kind of have that mind clutter mm. of, oh, well, I was just sending that email out or I was just talking to that athlete about um, that one training concept. If I warm up, I can kind of detach myself from the day and be more focused on the training. Uh, the physical readiness is, uh, quite frankly, a literal bridge and you can draw like a linear line. That's where that kind of principle of thermodynamics comes in where I say like, you know, if you were sitting in class and you're expecting to be ready, uh, from an absolute, like, you know, well-intentioned work set in your first block of training, like just bridge the gap physically right now that doesn't have to be super eloquent. It just means, okay, maybe like I warm up a little bit with a, with a fast paced jog. Maybe I just, like I mentioned, do some, if I, if I'm going to press, then maybe I can do some very scaled back or regressed pressing motions or some accessory pressing motions and call it my warm up. Um, we'll do that a lot of times and I can get into specifics uh, with our athletes, but, but the warm up doesn't have to be like this super fancy, long dynamic. It's just literally make a bridge between where you're at currently and where you want to be on your first work set. Uh, the injury prevention piece we talked about a little bit, but then, I mean, the science supports from a performance standpoint, individuals who are warmed up have faster muscle, muscle contractions, um, faster muscle relaxation, re, re, wow, relaxations, which just simply means like the ability to turn a muscle on and off, um, improvements in rate of force development, AKA power improvements in force production, AKA strength. Um, if you're an endurance athlete, a warm up will help with oxygen delivery because of the increased body temperature. Um, we've already talked about a little bit about blood flow. Um, that's just only going to help muscles be more active and then enhanced metabolic reactions are all things that the, um, the, a, a well-designed or well-intended warmup will, um, will play into when it comes to performing better during your workout. Something I noticed the other day since being on quarantine here is, uh, my fiance's little brother and I were lifting in the setback here. I'm in the attic right now. And, and he's a little, he's about 125 pounds. So he's a smaller, smaller kid. He's in high school, but uh, we were doing some barbell barbell rows and it was a kind of a newer uh, technique for him. And, and he wanted to start off like, like your, you know, kids, they just want to start off and lift as much as they can. And, and instead I had him, you know, take some light weights and really do that motion first. And it was yeah. a little, it was a little, you know, shake, not shaky, but you know, the form wasn't quite right. And then as he did that motion over and over, he was able to really make that mind muscle connection with which, which muscles in his back was he utilizing during this movement, 100%. you know, and then he was able to output, you know, more and, and, and lift more during the lift, you know, than I think he would have, if he had just gone into it without really, uh, making that bridging that gap, like you had said, you know, and Absolutely. that's, that's something I try to do with my lifts or too, is, is just make sure that, that, you know, I had that mind muscle connection between whatever muscle is, is supposed to be firing, you know, because otherwise it's like trying to start a really cold car in my mind. You know, could, it, it could takes have a better analogy. Yeah. It takes a little bit. And it's, and it's a balance too. Like this people somehow think that the more trained you get, um, that you can kind of skip some of those, like, oh, warm ups are for beginners, or I don't really need to do the warm up. I'm, I'm, I'm a dog, or I'm a big dog now, or I, you know, I'm some hoss. And so the fact of the matter is, the more, the more lift you, or the more weight you're going to lift during your work sets, the longer your warm up probably has to be. 
Um, and so sometimes we'll literally go to the whiteboard and I'll, I'll, I'll bring an athlete with me and say, okay, so on, let's say we're RDLing or let's say our primary uh, trap bar deadlift would be like a good primary movement. Um, you think you're going to hit 450 for our three rep trap bar deadlift today. Um, well, the trap bar is 45 pounds. So what jumps are you going to make with the weight? And some, and sometimes that's super helpful when you're, when you're new to warming up or you, you haven't done like a, a really detailed approach is to literally write it out and say, okay, the empty bar is 45 pounds. I'm probably going to add on, you know, 45s first um, because I'm going to such a high weight. So, you know, I'm going to go 135. And then maybe I'll add on 45s again and go 225. But at that point, I may start to make some smaller slivers, right? Maybe I go like, you know, um, 285 and then I jump to like 325 and then I do my last warm up at like, you know, 375 before I make my first I jump to my work set, like segmenting things down. Um, we always kind of look at it as if, you know, there's the physical warm up, but then you also need to warm up for the work sets. Um, and, and the reason being that if, if we want the time we're spending in the weight room to, to work for us, and I just go in there and I say, well, I'm going to do a set with the empty bar and I'm going to do, you know, a set at 225 on bench until failure. Wonderful. You got like maybe three minutes of work in there, right? Versus how much more work to your point could you do appreciating the movement, um, educating your body on where you, where you plan on activating today, um, spending that time grooving the movement itself um, so that you're more capable and ready to to, to hit a heavier load, thus getting more work in or hit a couple extra reps, thus getting more work in. I mean, training is just this constant battle of how much work can I get in, in the time I have. So if you're not warming up, you're leaving results on the table. But coach, if I warm up with 300, 350, 400 before 450, I'm going to tire myself out and I won't be able to lift as much as I would have. That's not, not a bad point, Bill. And I get that all the time. Um, that's fine. Do one or two, you know, if, let's say, let's say we're planning on doing three reps that day. Do one rep, right? Just leap, you know, I, I, yeah, absolutely. If I'm planning on doing 450 and I do a warm up at 400 for all three reps, while it's only like 80% of what I'm going to get to, like it's still work. Um, so in that example that you laid out there, I just, I'd have them do one rep right? One or two feel good reps. You're not going to fatigue yourself um, from, from the three rep that's coming, but it's going to provide a nice kind of uh, jump off point to those work sets. And the same thing, with, let's say I'm doing higher rep work, right? I have a set of, you know, uh, this would be absolutely terrible, but let's say I have like a set of 10 or 12 trap bar deadlifts. Like, oh, gosh. <laughs> and I'm just sweating thinking about it, right? Oh. So my warm ups, I could also shave down the reps a little bit too. So let's say my last warm up is, you know, if I have a 12 rep day on a, on a, on a primary movement, maybe my last warm up is just six reps. You know, I've got a feel for it. I know the, the, the weight jumps. Um, and, and now I'm ready to hit that first work set. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I know for myself, at least if I am trying to hit a PR, um, at least back when lifting heavy was new for me, uh, I would, I would, I would first put the bar on my back. For example, if it was squat, if I need, if I'm trying to lift, uh, at, you know, my, my PR for the, for that year, I would put, first put the weight on my back and at least let my body get used to it. And I think that's just kind of how I think of it. It's just, it's allowing your body to get used to whatever you're going to be doing and continually doing that, uh, before each workout. And that's, that's just, you know, my mindset when it comes to it. You know. Well, absolutely. Warm warm ups are in just as much mental as they are physical. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I don't know if you've seen the documentary Pumping Iron on Oh, absolutely. Netflix. Yeah, I think a lot of people have. But you see that there's this part in there where these guys, uh, and Arnold Schwarzenegger seems a little bit more athletic than some of them, but you see these guys on the football field playing catch and they're they're just they run like they're all bound up. You know, they can't <laughs> they can't do the movements and they're not they don't look athletic. And and is that I, I don't know. Did, you, did they get as big as they did because of their lifting, their lifting style of short range? I mean, I don't, I don't think that uh, they utilized their training and, and, and mobility as much as they yes. should have. And do you think, yes. do you think uh, that adding it would have either impaired their success in, in muscle building or strength? Because that's what a lot of people do believe is that, you know, if you stretch, you're going to, 
you know, it's hard. You, you won't be able to lift as much, you, you know? Yeah. And no. what I'm trying to say. No, I know exactly what you're trying to say. So a lot of people cite this one paper that says, well, stretching before a workout decreases power output. Um, and it absolutely does. But the, when you look at the, how they did the study, they did, um, they did like a sit and reach test. They did a vertical jump test. They did a sit and reach, and then they retested the vertical jump. And sometimes with that, I just wonder, was it the static stretching in between, or was it just literally the time in between? Right. So you sometimes have to look at some of these things, hmm. the skeptics mindset of, okay, well, what's, is, is it really going to hurt my performance or is it just one of those things where I feel like this podcast, but we keep coming back to this kind of exchange of time. How yeah. am I spending my time? Yeah. If, if I'm going to put, if I'm a bodybuilder, which is a whole nother training endeavor, but if oh, I'm trying sure. to put on as much mass as possible, um, there is a very healthy and I think um, new wave of bodybuilding training that is pretty much said we don't see a lot of hypertrophic or cross-sectional muscle fiber size increase with partial range of motion training. And in fact, we actually see greater muscle tears when you're trained, which is what you're trying to do, right? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm trying to, you know, essentially break down as much muscle tissue as possible so I can refuel and rebuild. Um, but we actually see more when we train to a full range of motion. So in your example of kind of the muscle bound, um, which has just been a, you know, uh, a common uh, what, avatar or kind of funny cartoonish, uh, you know, uh, depiction of, of people who lift for, for since that 60s and 70s golden, golden era of fitness. Mm -hmm. the, the fact of the matter is nowadays, a lot of bodybuilding coaches are coaching their athletes to train at, a, at the fullest range of motion possible. So if, and maybe that would be a, a kind of a soft plug for people who are like, I don't have time for all that mobility work. Well, then, you know, you, then you best not be training partial, partial ranges of motion. Now that doesn't mean to say that, you know, if I'm doing like a bench press and I'm, you know, training the full range of motion, um, that I could do a drop set with maybe like a board on my chest and do some partial reps to get some extra work in. If, if I am trying to elicit the most amount of muscle damage possible, I think sure. that is possible, but ah, I'd still, I'd still maybe want to see where I could go with the complete and fullest range. Um, it's so funny how we look at sometimes pressing movements or pulling movements. A lot of people give people flack for not squatting as deep as they could, but mm -hmm. like no one wants to call out, the person who's like not rowing as far as their shoulder blades could possibly retract or not doing um, a push up and fully protracting the shoulders at the top. Uh, you're probably always going to see me preaching this message of full range of motion because of, we want that control um, in the most complete way uh, with, with our joint ranges. I, yeah. I like that a lot. And I, it is something that I've struggled with. I can't lie. It is hard for me, you know, when I have class and other responsibilities to spend that time doing something that seems mundane. Um, but uh, after this episode and, and the stuff you've talked about, I'll definitely, you know, I'll definitely do my own research. And I think everybody listening should look into yeah. exercises uh, and, and ways to warm up for for the the movements that you'll be doing that day and i because like i said in the air force training they kind of it was a it was a one size fits all warm up stretching uh routine which which uh didn't work for me and i i feel mm -hmm. like if i had uh specialized my warm up warming up for the exercises i was going to be doing then i would have seen uh better results with in that way for sure. Well, a simple, I mean, a simple, you know, I know we're, we're wrapping up here, but a simple way, if, if, if you're a skeptic and you're saying this still maybe isn't like time that I could dedicate, or I've got training on a, you know, you put, you put out that podcast where you talked about your own training and, and, and kind of switching over to, to more of a superset mindset, um, superset your mobility work, right? So, you know, uh, if you're planning on benching and you're going to go, you know, warm up for that, or I don't care if it's flat or incline or dumbbell or whatever, let's say you're doing some type of upper body horizontal press um you know and you get in maybe a set with the empty bar hit the ground or, or do some mobilization for the wrists next set you add a little bit of weight um you know uh start to reach across the body or, or behind the ear tuck and, and start to hit the triceps a little bit maybe next uh you start to add a little bit more weight next set. so superset the mobility work in with your warm-ups 
um, as a way, you know, there's going to be breaks in between times on the bar. You're not flying through goodness sakes, put your phone back in your gym bag and, and move your body a little bit between sets, um, versus, uh, versus waste that time with, with something less worthwhile. Um, and, and, uh, you have an Instagram page that you run called UNW strength. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. At UNW strength is, uh, is kind of home to everything I'm putting out there. Um, performance related for Eagle athletics. Uh, and, and you put a lot of different, uh, tips and tricks on there as far as diet and working out or, or just, uh, you know, things like that. And so what, now that everybody, uh, is on this quarantine <laughs> or at least probably staying home or, or should be if you know, they're, they're not working or whatever. So what's, What's a workout really easy, no equipment, you know, maybe full body or, or something like that that people mm. can do right at home? I'm, uh, I'm kind of notorious um, amongst our athletes and, uh, and especially amongst, you know, our interns. You've already uh, interviewed George Obitz. Uh, he's one of my weight room workers and was interning me, with me this past semester. Um, I'm, I'm kind of a single leg guy. Um, being a strength coach and knowing that athletes have to be prepared for sports, predominant number of athletes are deficient in their ability to function on a single leg hmm. even though most sporting movements take place in a split stance or asymmetrical stance or even on one foot i think this is a great opportunity to develop single leg capabilities um the awesome thing about that is you don't need a ton of equipment to make that hard um one thing that i've really enjoyed uh actually about this quarantine and trying to find some 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 positivity in it is finding all the ways that I can adapt training on one and it, training. I should clarify, Bill. Training on one leg doesn't mean pistols is my only option, right? There are there are so many different ways that you can do a, a, an activity on one leg um, that will function because of the nature of it being on one foot, like a strength movement. Um, and and I am gonna I am gonna probably be the guy who's who's in that camp way more than just do like 30 goblet or 30 bodyweight squats because um you know death by reps because because that's all i can do with body weight um trust me you 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 find a way to kind of, of do some work on on single leg whether that's a really high box that you're stepping down from whether that's a split squat whether that's a single leg squat to a box whether that is a full pistol and then you don't actually need that much equipment to to add weight to that oh my goodness you know hold the jug of milk um, hold a crate or a flat of uh, bottled water, um, you know, hold this, hold a small child away from you. Um, again, I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of ways you can start to make things harder without added weight. Um, the second thing I would say besides single leg is tempo. Tempo work is bar none. Um, going to be a, a fantastic way to, to make things quote unquote harder and still induce a pretty substantial training effect. Uh, tempo work is just simply assigning time to a, a eccentric part of, or a isometric or concentric part of a lift. So if we use something, a lot of people know, like a push up, uh, instead of just repping out 20 push ups like the Instagram challenge, control your lowering for three, four, five seconds, do a pause at the bottom, do a three second pause at the bottom. Don't even do the full rep and just go to the bottom and hold that bottom position for 30 seconds, 60 seconds. Trust me, by the end of it, you're going to sit there and go, you know, oh my goodness, I was putting a lot of force through my hands, just controlling for those times on a body weight push up, right? Um, so I think those are some things that we're really going to see um, come out of, or I've already noticed in my own training come out of this season is the adaptability to make things harder um, without added load, which is this message I've been preaching for forever, which is why, why do we need to put five more pounds on? Isn't there a way we can ratchet up the, the tension or ratchet up the internal pressure some other way? Hmm. Um, because when you're, especially in my jurisdiction, when you're an athlete, uh, you, you, you can't always just add intensity like you can in the weight room. You have to yeah. find it within yourself, yeah. whether that's out on the pitch or on the court or, um, for me, when I was a thrower in the ring, you can't just say, well, we added 10 pounds to this, um, or we're going to, we're going to make you do two more reps. It's, you know, you have to find it within yourself. So being adaptable and being able to come up with, uh, your own solutions to your own problems is a huge part of being a, 
um, an athlete, and just being someone who loves physical culture. Solve problems. Um, and if you got obstacles in front of you, you know, ask questions, find solutions. Um, it doesn't mean that you got to go it alone. Um, uh, but but maybe, maybe maybe don't get suckered into like the I just need to do a thousand burpees or a million push ups or a bajillion bodyweight squats. There's so much more we can do without equipment. Um, but my two things would be something on one foot or one leg and and tempo work. That's great. You know, I, I got to thank you again for coming on to this, this episode today. And uh, I, I don't know what your schedule is like now since being home, but I really appreciate that. And, uh, you know, for anyone listening, I'm going to put this on YouTube like I have the past couple. Uh, it's called, you know, the Too Easy Project on YouTube, Instagram as well. I'll put a couple more uh, snippets of the episodes on there, drop some more content, uh, as well as the audio uh, on Spotify and Apple podcasts um, and go follow his uh, UNW strength page on Instagram. Find a lot of good tidbits on there. Um, once again, coach Gish, thanks for coming on. I really, I really do appreciate it. No, thanks Bill. It was an awesome conversation. I appreciate it too. Awesome. Thanks. We'll see you around. All right. Sounds good.